Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, we have people logging in from all across the globe. Thank you so much for joining this session on inflation and supply shortages. My name is uh, Shakti Prasad. I'm the head of content at Bero, and I run the Procurement Espresso magazine. Uh, before I get started with the session, just a few housekeeping rules to be kept in mind. Uh, next, yeah, housekeeping, yeah. All the participants will be on listen-only mode for the entire duration of the webinar. We will take up the questions at the end of the presentation. We, have, we plan to wrap up our presentation, uh, say, within 40 minutes, uh, but we would encourage our attendees to key in their questions anytime during the session. So if you have any story or any situation relating to inflation or supply shortage in your category or in your markets, please feel free to post it in the Q&A box. Uh, please type them into the Q&A box, question box, given in your control panel. And we will try to uh, answer all of them uh, you know, during the session. There could be a lag of a few seconds uh, in between the transition of the slides. So please bear with us. If you have any difficulty in joining the webinar, please try to log back in or key in your queries in the Q&A box, and we will try to help you. Now, I am happy to introduce uh, Vail Kumar Krishnan, the Vice President of Research at Vero. I hope you all can see him on your screens. Uh, Vail is a veteran in, in the procurement intelligence space uh, with over 15 years of experience. He currently heads the digital practice at Vero and oversees the research output delivered via uh, Vero's flagship platform, verolive.ai. And over all these years, um, Vail has worked on nearly 10,000 projects uh, across industries, domains, and categories. Uh, thank you so much for joining the session today, Vail. Thanks, Shakti. Pleasure is all mine. OK. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So Vail, uh, the flavor of the season is you know, inflation and supply shortages. A lot of commodities have witnessed a run up in prices. Uh, you know, it's the mainstream media has been covering it. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we witnessed a uh, petrol shortage in the UK, one of the most industrialized uh, nations in the world. In fact, India uh, is staring at a coal shortage uh, to power for its power plants. China faced the same, and there's a lot of power cuts. Gas prices have gone up in Europe. So a lot, many commodities have witnessed a run-up in the prices. Uh, and of course, it, we have mentioned the percentage of run-up in the prices on the screens. Uh, beyond this, do you have any specific anecdote, Vail, uh, on the impact of price rise uh, in a particular commodity or category that you could you know, share with our, with our audience here? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for bringing that point up, Shakti. I've probably got uh, a few hundred examples. I'll try to uh, contain my excitement, and I'll try to stick to a few examples. Uh, so Shakti, uh, before I get into specifics and uh, my experience on working with clients who have been seeing a lot of inflation on the categories and how they're managing it, uh, I want to kind of uh, tell you about an interesting conversation I was having in a business meeting literally three years ago before this webinar, which we are sitting on today, is uh, I was sitting with a CEO and then an ex CPO and a COO, and they're having a business meeting about something. And uh, one of the interesting things which came out of that conversation was how there's been a reversal of fortunes, right? And what I mean by that is when you look at specialized niche services, right? So let's say uh, services which are uh, digital in nature or which are very AI driven in nature or which are very uh, uh, platform oriented in nature, which was for example, something which is uh, uh, in high demand five years ago is actually super commoditized. Now prices are falling every year, every quarter, and things which are called commodities, right, are exploding. Uh, like you said, coal, natural gas, base oils, pretty much everything, right. So one of, one of the things which I wanted to do today in this discussion is talk about our outputs from our category cost inflation solution and framework. Uh, no theoretical concepts, only continuously tracked and monitored data over the past many years, which uh, we will showcase uh, as we move on. So with respect to uh, what has happened in 2020 versus 2021 with regard to shortages, even though the end effect is the same, I think the drivers are absolutely the polar opposites, uh, Shakti. In 2020, uh, suppliers were not producing enough. 2021, they're producing, but it's not enough. Buyer's market in 2020, supplier's market in 2021. 
low margins, currently high margins for suppliers. Low utilization for suppliers last year, high demand currently, weak demand last year. And this year it's been crazy changes because of winter storms and accidents and shutdowns. 2020 portal trade bottlenecks, but right now the spread has gone crazy in 2021. So some of the observations which I've, se I've seen Shakri is that uh, there's been many commodities, especially around benzene, acetic acid, uh, polystyrene, ethyl acetate, methyl isobutyl ketone, epoxy resins, carbon steel, where prices have gone crazy, like you're talking about 50% and higher. So any buyers out there who are delving in categories around plastics, resins, synthetic fibers, lubricants, dyes, uh, fruit flavoring, automobiles, aircrafts, snowboards, um, metal acetates, organic esters are gonna see a lot of a lot of lot of category inflation that's something which i've noticed even formulations pesticides so on and so forth uh energy is going to affect all categories uh, so you're going to see uh, a broad horizon of categories around cement and smelting and cement manufacturing food processing getting affected by, by those so those are my immediate observations around uh, the commodities uh, Shakti. Okay. Okay. That's great. Uh, you, you, you covered a wide gamut of commodities out there. Uh, uh, next, next slide, please. Yeah. So this, uh, so we have this direct cost index, which you, you've been, which you've built it many years ago, right? Several years ago and which you've been using it. Uh, I mean, you, in a sense, you and your research team uh, at Bero have been using it for quite some time. Uh, can you, can you, can you please explain uh, what this index is and what it aims to do because I see a lot of numbers there and there are some numbers in the brackets also. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So let me let me step back, take a couple of minutes and answer your question, uh, Shakti. Uh, so Shakti, this is something which we've been doing for many years. So first of all, wanted to kind of set a context from the baseline that this is nothing new, right? Everybody knows this. But one of the things which we've done is we built something called a direct cost index. Uh, you could use the word COGS index as a proxy. We build a SGNA index, we build a packaging index, we build an R&D index, we build a logistics index, right? So these are the five broad, uh, let's let's call it bottom line uh, uh, heads, which we cover on a constant basis, which we are tracking every month, every quarter, so on and so forth. In this particular piece, which we are showcasing right now, a direct cost index is basically a baseline, which tells you when you compare your spend contribution for commodities, COGS, direct materials last year, how much should I expect to spend more if I'm ordering the same quantities for the same configuration specs this year, right? And the alarming results are, and we've run this through a tool, like I said, it's automated, we track this on a constant basis, no great shades. But the point over here, Shakti, is that most of them are going up. For example, when you look at metals and minerals on top, it's going up by 26.4%. The number in brackets yep. basically is spend weighted, which basically means that metals and minerals is going up by 26.4%. But then when you look at it as a spend contribution of my overall cogs, we normalize it. So you're basically weighted averaging yep. it, and then you're showing what the numbers are. And the overall index, which you see on top, Shakti, where it says 15%, mm -hmm. over the last six months, so literally over the last six months, there's been a index correction of cogs, materials as a percentage of revenue at least by 15% across all of those industries which you see over there, which is metals, mm -hmm. agro, chemicals, packaging, logistics, and transportation. And what I've also listed on the right-hand side are the categories where you're seeing price drop. So there's some, there's, there's a little bit of silver lining over there. So there are some agro commodities where prices are falling down, so on and so forth. There's isopropanol, which, which is showing falling prices. But I, I, I think the, the, the elephant in the room is basically the categories which are seeing a price increase which we've listed over there so essentially this will help you with budgeting this will help you with understanding which are the categories which are going to see increased price uh, uh let's say elevation over the next few months okay uh, i just see hops and adjuncts uh, you know is a category with maximum price drop so does it mean the beer prices won't go up um i'm hoping so shakti i'm hoping so we'll know friday evening this week <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah. So we are, we have indirect categories. So you have built. So you you mentioned SG and A index, uh, which again is very interesting because 
uh, one of the common queries that we do receive is, uh, you know, how do you measure uh, cost indexes for indirect services? Because for directs, it's kind of, uh, you know, apparent. You have you have prices, indices, published prices, and you can uh, build uh, an index of uh, cost around it. So this is this is interesting. You have uh, built a cost index for indirects. So can you please explain what's happening here? The yeah, absolutely, time. absolutely, absolutely. So the way you interpret the chart is exactly the same, which uh, I explained. But the interesting point is that the correction for indirect services, which let's call it a SGNA index, uh, when you look at it at a CPO level or a category director level or a category manager level, is not as pronounced as you saw at food rates, right? So in rates, um, you've got your dairy products, meat, starch, aromatic solvents, elastomers, glycols, polymers, hygiene care raw materials, rigid and flexible packaging raw materials, silicones, mining, PO, PKO, vegetable oils, uh, ferrous and non-ferrous metals, paper packaging, those are essentially driving up costs. But when you actually look at some of the SGNA line items, they're probably not, not as pronounced, right? So the only changes which we are seeing are, for example, in ATM services, office furniture, FAO, very surprisingly, Shakti, uh, AML software, PO extending platforms, debt collection, and then in facilities management, we're seeing a correction in cleaning and waste management. And every time I use the word correction, I'm talking about inflation because if prices are going down, no one, no one is uh, worried about that. Yeah, that's a good thing. And then in HR, we're seeing an increase in employee relocation and outplacement. So those are certain categories in which you're seeing a lot of increase in index, essentially driven around labor costs, labor availability, yeah. high levels of attrition, employee turnover, so on and so forth. But the way you interpret it is exactly the same, Shakti. If I was spending $100 last year on SGNA overall, what is the spend which I should be expecting to budget for this particular year or the next fiscal? Is it $2 more? Is it $3 more? Is it $10 more? And that's what the indices tell you. Yeah, in fact, temp labor is mentioned. And in fact, the, one of the main causes for the fuel shortage in UK was lack of truck drivers. Uh, in fact, I think yeah. our research shows, uh, you know, it's not gonna be, uh, confined to the UK alone, even the US is going to experience a truck driver shortage in the next uh, uh, three to three to four years, I suppose, and it's going to play out for a period of time. Exactly. Yeah, anyway, uh, next next slide, please. Yeah, uh, so what what what, are, what do you mean by direct services, uh, Vail? Uh, because yeah, we, sure. we have direct materials, we have indirects. So what do you mean by direct services here? And uh, again, we have a cost index in front of us. Yeah, sure, sure. So I want to make sure I don't uh, uh, repeat some of the points which I've already spoken, uh, Shakti. So um, direct services essentially refers to services which fits into a specific industry, which is not truly agnostic, which is not a soft service which cuts across everybody, like IT software. There's no industry which doesn't buy it. So these are very focused on specific industries, probably banking, probably telecom, so on and so forth. But the key which I wanted to strive or, uh, to uh, drive home over there, Shakti, is that any of those categories which are listed on that particular slide uh, is basically being driven by a lot of labor arbitrage, which is actually going up, right, and not going down. For example, FAO is seeing a lot of change, right? The reason being India, it used to be about $33,000 per FT, it's gone up. Poland, similarly. Philippines, China, Romania, Costa Rica. So any transactional activities, they, they are seeing a larger increase as compared to last year. So that's something which needs to be kept in mind while budgeting for these categories. Okay, cool. Uh, just a reminder for the audience, we will be discussing a lot of numbers, charts, data. So if you have any questions uh, or any clarifications, please post them here because uh, we'll be moving ahead. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we have listed out uh, in a few examples of supply shortages here uh, well in the slide just to give an overall sense of what's happening. Of course, you did mention uh, some of the instances you know, right at the beginning. Uh, of course, semi semiconductor chip shortage hitting the automobile sector, uh, it's been very much documented. Is there anything uh, nuanced uh, that you would like to share uh, beyond the headlines, I mean? Yeah, sure, sure. So I'll do a drill down uh, this time, uh, Shakti. So I'll, I'll get into specifics. 
Um, so I, I've got multiple examples. Do stop me if you think we are going over time or uh, sure. uh, in terms of uh, retaining interest here. Uh, so Shakti, uh, let's say we are talking about a large category like polymers, right? So in polymers, let's say you're talking about uh, polypropylene or let's say we're talking about PP homopolymers. Everybody buys it, right? So automobile buy it. You've got packaging who buys it. You've got uh, pharma companies, medical devices companies who, who buy it. So let's say you're, you're buying poly, uh, polypropylene homopolymer, and then you're looking at one to two million pounds per year, right? And you want to find out uh, what's the inflation in that particular category. But what's more important is who's got the willingness and the capability to store an additional two million pounds, right? So the concept I want to talk about over here is that of safety stocks, right? So uh, I would I would strongly recommend users who buy a specific category, especially around the commodity business, other than looking at just the category inflation, to also look at capacity additions, which might ease, for example, in H2 2021, where we already are sitting in three months in, right? Look at lead times, right? As to whether uh, moving away from buying from one particular geography to another geography, is that going to actually save costs or should I reshore it locally? That's another point, Shakti. Another one, operational rates. Keep an eye on operational rates. Uh, for example, when you look at US refineries, they're averaging at about 93% as of today, right? So th those are historical 19 month highs uh, in, in terms of operational rates, right? And also keep looking at what the total raw material cost is as a percentage of your quoted selling price uh, and also as a percentage of total production cost. And you'll understand that the average spend, for example, we were discussing about polypropylene homopolymers propylene it literally was at 415 dollars shakti and my reference okay. is to the average spare spread uh it moved up to for example um i think about uh, 870 dollars last half mm. it's currently mm. sitting at 1105 dollars so it jumped from 415 to 1100 and that's only the raw material cost i'm not even going into energy so on and so forth so it's very important to look at each one of these factors before looking at you know uh, do I change my sourcing strategy? How do I manage inflation? So on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, of course, we'll be coming to that. You know, you have a structured model in place. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so shortages is, of course, leading to inflation. In fact, uh, the economists um, are discussing, you know, they're they, they saying that it's a combination of excess demand and a sudden opening up the opening up of the economy after COVID-19, uh, you know, shutdowns uh, led to excess demand and supply shortages. Like you said, people, supplies are producing, but it's not enough. Uh, so it's leading to inflation. A any pointed observation here before we move on to the inflation model? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things which I was doing while you're pulling up that slide, Shakti, is to see uh, how big the audience is. And it looks like there's a wide representation across multiple industries. So quick uh, reality check in the next 30 seconds. Uh, some of the largest changes which I have noticed, Shakti, over the last uh, six months, uh, metals, huge change, carbon steel, iron ore, molybdenum, tin, aluminum, copper, zinc. Similarly, in agro, corn, butter, xylitol, whey powder, citric acid, beef, soybean oil, rapeseed oil, right? Chemicals, I think we touched upon it enough, but pretty much all your ethanolamines, acetones, acetates, sure. alcohols, solvents, so on and so forth. Same with packaging, blisters, laminate and collapsible tubes, cotton boards, pulp, fluff, recovered paper, caps, closures, wooden pallets. Everything is seeing a large level of inflation over the last six months. Just wanted to call that out. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, the points mentioned here, obviously it's, it's, it's out there in the market. We just called out just for, uh, you know, clarity's sake. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we have come to the main uh, story here. Uh, so we have this cost inflation model. Uh, briefly, Vail, uh, what is it and what it aims to do? Yeah, sure. So this is the model which I started off uh, or segued the beginning of the webinar into uh, Shakti. So we have the category cost inflation solution, right? I definitely look at it as a solution where uh, you can actually simulate a model which gives you a true assessment of category exposure to all kinds of inflationary headwinds expected in the next six to 12 months. In simple words, it's a forward looking predictive on demand inflation detector, right? And it basically tells you based on market, based on the category, based on logistics, based on macroeconomic conditions, 
what is the potential cost inflation for each one of your categories. It simulates the category price structure, logistics, inflation, shows what the index is. It also gives you a snapshot of how each category is stacked against the other. It shows interdependencies between two categories saying, hey, tier two, if something changed in this category, is it gonna affect tier three in another category? It gives you a snapshot of the sourcing country risk, and it also gives you instant visibility into supply demand outlook for 12 months. In summary, it basically helps in identifying a risk-free alternate sourcing destination and suppliers, along with how much is it gonna help me reduce inflation, reduce my risk based on my appetite to change. That's what it actually pulls out as an automated output, Shakti. Sorry, I was on mute. So it's mentioned here, uh, you know, uh, the model gives a forecast for six to 12 months. Yeah. Um, for all the categories, right? I mean, whatever category you put in, you get a forecast for the six to 12 months. Yeah, so it's quite simple, Shakti. Name the category. Tell us what your supply locations are and what your demand locations are, especially for directs. For indirects, it probably doesn't make much sense. But, you know, just key in those and it will generate those outputs. And as we move to the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more sure. detail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, the methodology, would you like to explain, um, you know, how this model is built? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'd love to do that. Uh, so Shakti, the way the model is built is you come in and then you choose the categories which are of interest to you. I'll send across your categories to us, right? Saying here are the 100 categories uh, which we as an organization manage. And here are the buying locations and here are the demand locations, supply and demand locations. And what the tool does is it actually pulls all of these data points, right? And what I mean by data points is it actually starts pulling information on, just as an example, the price forecast for each one of those categories 12 months 24 36 months out what are the input variables which go into each one of those categories broken down into raw materials sgna spend energy logistics last mile um, uh, uh, delivery it actually pulls all of those inputs and then it basically overlays macroeconomic parameters and what it does is it basically tells here are 10 different options which you have if you take option number one your inflation adjustment is gonna be 10% less, 15% less. Which of those countries? Is there a trade ban? No, yes. Is there a logistics impact? No, yes. Is there a risk profile change if you're gonna do it? Because there is a substitution cost involved. You can't switch off certain categories. So what volumes can you switch over from country one to country two? And then who are the suppliers who will actually help you beat, for example, some of these inflationary pressures? So all of those outputs seamlessly gets generated once you just choose the categories and then the sourcing location and the destination location. Okay, uh, before we move on to the next slide, uh, Vail, uh, you said this has been in use for quite for some time, right? And uh, so on a non-inflation days, uh, how did you use this? Of course, now currently, of course, the world is experiencing uh, unprecedented inflationary conditions. But uh, it wasn't the case about three years ago, right? Uh, or maybe only a few categories had experienced. I mean, so what was the history behind this? Yeah, the history behind this was disruptions, uh, Shakti, right? So I think uh, today it's uh, supply shortage, today it's price increase, so on and so forth. But every procurement professional sees disruptions on a daily basis. And you could have hundreds of disruptions. It could okay. be cyber attacks, it could be port shutdowns. It could be an earthquake. It could be a act of God or man or humankind, right? Any unfortunate event, right? So we built this tool long back purely to track disruptions. And like I said, a fundamental can also be a disruption. Just to give you an example, we used to do a lot of work for uh, one of our food and beverage clients where they were like, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm buying corn, wheat, sugar, coffee, oranges from Brazil, just as an example, right? Uh, and, and they're like, um, uh, 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 it, it's the, the weather conditions are really not suiting my tenure time frame, right? So I'm actually looking to move my center of gravity towards a certain uh, um, a direction. I'm trying to actually move my um, revenue impact into a certain direction, but then the supply market is really not conducive, right? So what it would do is it would actually tell you, hey, con, dry weather in the US, harvesting season in Brazil is so and so. 
and hence fix your contracts in the months of December and February. So it would actually give you an educated output. Okay. Coffee, Vietnam and Colombia can be considered as an alternative. Oranges, uh, high competition in Brazil, you could at least move 10% of your volumes to Egypt. So based on the inputs which you provide, it would actually give you a uh, category specific output, which is real time, which is very specific to supply demand, capacity data, utilization data, uh, what is the level of flex which is there in that particular category for you be for you to be able to fit your business goals uh, in this case inflation beating inflation is my business goal but you can actually set it for any business goal of yours which is a disruption understood okay um, uh, next slide please uh, well this looks of course this is the framework uh, you know that goes behind the model um, so, can you can you can you explain how this framework was derived, and very briefly because we have three more slides, four more slides to cover with. So, and how this really influences the output uh, in in terms of acu accuracy, I would say. Yeah, yeah. So one of the first things which is very critical, Shakti, is how successful has this model been, right? And one of the things which we keep tracking is what we call as a forecast accuracy. You said something six months back, what's the accuracy now, right? And be very open with our accuracy numbers and uh, the accuracy numbers are gonna ch change by category. It's gonna change by time frame. Uh, six months accuracy could be perfect. 12 months out, not so. 24 months might be a little off, right? So that's something which we provide. But without getting into the theoretical aspect of it, so the point here is quite simple, Shakti. It will give you an output which basically tells you what is the category distribution by expected inflation in a 12 month frame which are the categories which are going to see the highest, which are the categories which are going to see the lowest, and what's there in between. You can add your spend data if you want to. It's not mandatory. So you also have a weighted average saying that, okay, this is the highest, but spend is low, and hence my impact is a little low. So that output automatically gets generated. The most interesting output is it also tells you which are the categories where you actually have alternatives out there in the marketplace, right? So which are the alternate countries which you could actually look at based on the raw material index, category price index, your inflation leading indicator index, who has capacity, who has available capacity, what's the capacity utilization, when is supply going to recover in each one of those geographies, and hence what's the price arbitrage, what's the lead time arbitrage, what's going to be the change in the sourcing strategy, uh, what volumes make sense? You, you just can't move 100% of our volumes to another supplier because a tool said so. So all of those realistic market-based inputs get generated out uh, as, a, as an output. Okay, um, that's interesting. Um, so when, when you say model, uh, Wayne, is it, um, uh, is it an Excel file or is it an online tool? Yeah, so it's an it's an Excel file, uh, Shakti, because there's a lot of variables which need to be uh, preset and predetermined. Like, like I said, it was not built only for inflation. It covers every possible disruption. Inflation is the major one, but it covers multiple disruptions. So it is an Excel file, which of course is shared to users, so on and so forth. And uh, I, I don't want to get too much into our digital platform, but then we also have their own live.ai. Uh, been around for quite some time, which is a business uh, we all head together. And uh, it has the forecasting module, the cost modeling module, the disruption module uh, in separate areas so that users can actually look at a consolidated view uh, as a dashboard on the platform. So it's available on platform on live.ai uh, and it's available offline for people who don't want to log, log onto a platform and they want to see the results. Okay, so you you... You you said we, you share the Excel file with the clients, uh, or or do we do it for them? Yeah, and it's shared with them. So, yeah, it's shared with them. So you can actually do a scenario analysis saying, hey, gotcha. what if prices went up by 35% instead of 30%? What's going to be my overall COGS impact? Right. So you, you can do all of those too. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on. Next slide, please. This is the sample output. So this is from the spreadsheet, Wayne, or is it from the yeah. online tool? Uh, yeah. It looks very colorful. Yeah, colorful. yeah it, it's a heat map, as uh, it is obvious. It's it's an output from uh, one of our one of our engagements. I've removed the names of categories, but it essentially okay. tells you what should you be worried about six months from today, what should you be worried about twelve months from today, and uh, what's going to be the impact on your overall spend, and hence on your COGS, on your SGNA, on your packaging indices, so on and so forth. Okay. And um, 
do we give interpretations for this? Uh, uh, of course, there is there is an Excel file and there is an online tool, but uh, do we also, uh, you know, provide our interpretations and analysis along with this, or is it just the outputs? Oh no, no, the interpretations come along with it, uh, Shakti, and I think that's the most critical part. So depending upon who the client is, for example, if somebody is from the engineering and construction and building material space. What should you be doing for software timber versus rebar versus structural steel versus fiberglass versus flat glass versus insulators? What's in demand? What's changing? All of those inputs are as a, it, it's it's a part of the outputs. So it becomes very category centric along with recommendations based on the pain points. Okay, okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, I think this is very important, right? We we spoke about a model and I'm I'm perhaps it's a bit abstract uh, for our audience. So can you explain in straight, simple terms, like what will they get out of it? I mean, if, if, if they're looking at the output, you know, what can they do with the output? I think that's very important. Sure, absolutely, absolutely, Shakti. Good question. So point number one, what they get as an output is, which are the list of countries I could probably reconsider, right? For example, for my polymer sourcing strategy, can I move a certain amount of volumes away from baton rouge and uh, point comfort can i move it to um, for example uh, a, 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 a middle eastern supplier can i move it to a south korean supplier right so it clearly tells you which countries who are the suppliers right then it gets into specifics double click on it what capacities are there what operating rates are there what's the freight impact what's the risk impact what's the country impact what's the trade balance impact uh, what's the uh, what's the level of flexibility out there in the supply chain? All of those are basically shown, right? And the way it's shown is it's actually also shown through a multi-tier supply chain mapping, saying here's the category you're buying, here's tier one, tier two, three, tier three, tier four. Here are the risks across each part of the value chain. Here's where the supply constraints are. Here's where the capacity constraints are. So it breaks it down at a category level. Nothing is theoretical, right? And then it also tells you what's the supply demand delta. How does it how is it going to change, right? Is this temporary? Is this permanent? Right. So all of those recommendations are clearly shown. So that's one part. It also tells you what you can do, right? And we truly believe that there are only four things any user can do in a situation like this: either renegotiate, uh, renegotiate. I think it's quite obvious what that means. Or you can reassign volumes, right? Work with an alternate supplier, right? Or recalibrate your sourcing strategy, reshore it, right? Why are we buying from another country when the prices are really higher out there in another continent? or reallocate volumes. Can I move volumes from one supplier to another? Can I move away from a non-integrated supplier to a diversified supplier, right? So how do you reallocate? So the four hours, so all of those are broken down and sent across as part of the outputs. And it also gives you a complex cost model, right? Which basically tells you that, hey, based on all of your inputs, here's what you should be doing, for example, in terms of safety stock, in terms of inventory. Here's an input you can pass on to sales to let them know that margins are um, uh, falling or margins of the suppliers are very high. Here's data which you can actually send to production to let them know that this is the amount of uh, uh, production which can actually be supported considering the current market environment. Yeah. Similarly, payment terms to finance. Uh, what can you send to your partners, to your suppliers? So it actually builds out that entire interface, which is a cost model along with the price forecast with a connect in into different partners outside of procurement. So those are those are standard outputs which are asked of us. Sorry. Okay. Oh, so moving on. The next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, mitigation is very. I mean, I, 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 you know, I wanted to ask you this. It's, it, this is we are like perhaps looking at, you know, once in maybe 20, 30 year scenario. You know, when it comes to runaway inflation. Usually, individual countries and regions used to face uh, inflationary pressures, but this is perhaps the first time the West is facing such a huge run-up uh, in prices. Perhaps uh, you know after late 70s, uh, 80s, uh, one could say. Is it possible to mitigate? Uh, you know, is it especially when it's so systemic and if it's so widespread? Is it possible to, you know, using this model or any other model for that? For that matter, I know even if we don't consider the model, for example, can procurement get something out of it? Is it possible to achieve any cost savings target? I know you have a very interesting slide uh, coming up next. We can address that, but I'm, you know, purely from a mitigation point of view, Vale, is it 
you know what, what are the clients telling you what are you hearing from the market is is it even possible to mitigate yeah yeah absolutely so i'll talk about that uh, shakti and we'll save the best for the last the same target slide but before that you can mitigate absolutely yes right so point number 1 one of the most common mitigation uh, techniques which we've seen most of our clients practice right now shakti is spot contracts everybody is waiting for supply to recover nobody is signing long term contracts right so everybody wants supply to supply to recover number 1 number 2 capacity will overflow in 2022 right so my my recommendation is follow the capacity right follow the utilization very important especially in export markets that's point number 2 point number 3 integration with feedstock is super critical especially in a supply shortage environment keep an eye on that number 4 always keep an eye on inventory levels and safety stock yours uh, the suppliers vmi own stock it doesn't matter watch out for inventory levels and safety stock number 5 peak container shipping charges are going to continue so that has to be mitigated so if you can actually keep an eye on all of these five points i'll just repeat it shakti spot contracts follow the capacity and follow the utilization which direction that's moving integration with feedstock super critical watch out for inventory levels and safety stock keep an eye on container shipping charges it's going to go further up this year if these five are taken care of through good market intelligence um, that's the best five steps you could take as of today okay so you're saying it's it's still not late uh, because the, the forecast uh, people are forecasting that it may uh, this shortages and inflation can go beyond 2022 maybe till the first quarter 2023 and it's it, i mean there's no consensus yet but that's the general discussion you know around the economist circle yeah i i can give you our our, our output model numbers uh, shakti and uh, this is a broad sweeping statement so we'll have to go down to every category right now i'll stay at a larger level short term yeah. spec price hikes medium term marginal uptick when i say medium term i'm talking 6 months out long term recovery in supply and capacity additions absolutely going to happen across metals agro packaging logistics so this is a temporary setback it's going to continue for maybe another 9 months long term there will be recovery um next slide please yeah i think uh, uh, we are continuing with this mitigation steps uh, i believe uh, this model can be ported on to uh, category planning uh, am i right and and then you have given this example of resins and carbon steel yeah 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 so answer is yes uh, shakti so this is the four hours which i was talking about just to jog everyone's memory can i renegotiate can i reassign volumes and uh, my uh, alternate suppliers can i recalibrate my sourcing strategy can i reallocate the model will clearly tell you which of these four are possible how do you do it who do you do it with what are the steps i need to take what are the numbers i need to have in mind that that's the entire interpretation of the module it fits into your category strategy like you already said okay um that's interesting uh, next slide please Yes, uh, this is this is a very interesting slide uh, you showed me just before the uh, start of the webinar, uh, Vail. Um, so there, there there are four columns in here. Uh, the category you've just given some examples, right? So the categories and the price inflation experienced by each of these categories, and there are the last two is what caught my attention. That is the savings target, the percentage. So it's March 2021, which basically got done, and then the upcoming, which is March 2022. and there's a considerable reduction in the savings target percentage uh so does it mean that uh you know the inflation has actually made procurement's job a little bit easier in terms of savings target that is if you take uh, you know ldpe instead of 6% i i'm just maybe looking at you know 1.8% of uh, savings target i i know this is maybe not the right way to look at it uh so couple of things well so how did you arrive at the savings target percentage for each of these categories and if you can frame it against the price inflation and what to expect uh, till march 20 2022 i think that will be very helpful sure absolutely so first question was uh, how do we get the savings achieved so shakti as you know our uh, berolive.ai platform has uh, roughly about 10000 procurement organizations who are part of what we call as uh, the curated procurement only exclusive community of category managers category directors and cpos 
roughly about 106,000 individual users, again, only from strategic sourcing. And one of the things which we do on a quarterly basis, and we've been doing this for many years now, like I said, none of this is new, is we basically run benchmarks on multiple areas, and one of them is basically savings achieved. And what I've done over here is I've pulled out numbers only for a few categories. We run it for a few hundred categories, is what did people achieve last year, right? And you see the numbers all the way to the right-hand side, uh, or, or, you know, the last column, right? And one of the things which I did was I also ran a poll which basically asked users saying, how much do you expect to achieve? That's last but one, where you see the smaller numbers, 1%, 1.8%, right? And I'll tell you what this means, uh, Shakti. The way in which savings targets are being defined are quite simple, right? So savings targets across procurement organizations are defined based on budgeted savings. That's your previously purchased price versus budgeted price. The difference is called your budgeted saving. And then you've got your additional savings, which comes from negotiation, right? Some total of those is your total savings. And then the savings, which is uh, objective-based, company goal-based. And then there's achieved savings, which is approved and uh, confirmed by finance, right? And then you've got your quantity optimization, so on and so forth. The most interesting thing which we saw was numbers have become one-tenth, one-fifth of what it was last year. Does this mean that because it's one-tenth or one-fifth, it's easier? It's tougher, right? Because you're looking at category inflation at unprecedented levels, demand at unprecedented levels, capacity constraints at unprecedented levels, that current procurement scorecards, even if it's 10%, 15%, 20% of last year's, is going to be even more difficult to achieve. That's my interpretation of that particular piece of output. Okay, uh, we, we received a few questions as to, uh, you know, how to how to go, I mean, how to start basically, you know, it's, it's a uh, collection of comments. Uh, basically the message was, you know, how do we start using it? And where do we start basically? And we had a poll question, which I thought of running it right towards the end, but I think it will be uh, topical if we actually run it now. Uh, is it okay, uh, Mirza, can we run the poll question now or should we wait? Okay, this- Let's run it, Shruti. Uh, yeah okay can we run the poll question please and shakti in case yeah. any of your questions are unanswered uh, do remind me i'm sorry if yeah, yeah sure sure yeah. sure so well uh basically you uh, you know you are you said you're offering some kind of free consultation right to determine the inflation supply shortage impact on your category so dear audience you can just either answer yes or no if you're interested in a free consultation from Bero. You can say yes uh, if you if you are not interested. Uh, please go ahead and vote no. There is no compulsion at all. Uh, meanwhile, if you have any comments, I know some of you had asked how to start. Uh, you know, basically they are looking for you know some kind of assessment. That's why we thought of running this poll right up front instead of right towards the end. Uh, Do you want so me to answer the question? You want me to wait for a bit? Uh, sorry, what? Go on, wait. Did you want me to answer that question now, or did you want me to wait for a little bit? Uh, yes, I mean, if you could answer it briefly while people are voting. Sure, absolutely, Shakti. So it's quite simple. Let us know which categories, basically the names of the categories, and it doesn't matter what taxonomy it is, NASCS, UNSPSC, mm -hmm. E-Class, it doesn't matter. What are the categories okay. you're interested in assessing? And then what are your sourcing locations and what are your demand locations? That's all we need. We don't need any confidential uh, private data okay. from you. Okay. Uh, can you can you just repeat it? Sorry. Uh, I, th I think you're a bit. I mean, I didn't catch it. Just briefly for those four points, what is required to start off? Okay. So it's literally two points, Shakti. The names of the categories and the yeah. sourcing location and the demand location. That's it. That's all we need. That's it. That's it. So basically, that's required for the consultation, right? To start off. Yeah for the consultation you can you can go deep dive and go into spec based consultation uh that's, that's probably a overkill in the beginning so just to do a consultation just a list of categories and where are you buying from and where are you consuming it that's it okay okay uh, I really mean the names of the countries not the names of the suppliers so okay uh can we close out the poll i think it's been there on the screen for some time uh mirza can we close out the poll please did we receive any? Okay. Yeah, it's gone. So we can go back to the presentation. I think we can open up the audience Q and A. It's. Uh, uh, I know we have a couple of slides. Uh, okay. Before we, of course, this 
multi-tier supply chain mapping comes along with the uh, uh, inflation model right away because we're getting questions. Perhaps we can take those questions now. Uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely, Shakti. I think that's more important. We could save this or we could uh, leave this too. Okay, this is from Ashley Norton. Um, many manufacturers single source uh, because of the cost of tooling and complexity. What is the strategy for mitigation when this problem occurs? Resource is not a simple answer. Uh, take printed circuit boards, for example, in uh, auto parts, aero, etc. That's a good question, actually. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it. it there is a complex answer which we probably already have access to. Uh, do we get into specific answers, uh, Shakti? So uh, I could get into specifics around, um, um, for example, an industry as an example, or we could actually send these larger answers out uh, post uh, the meeting. How do you how do you want me to tackle this? Um, maybe briefly you could mention to Ashley, and then maybe we can mail her uh, later. Yeah, yeah. So you'll have to repeat the question then, Shakti, so that I can. Okay, many many manufacturers single source because of the cost of tooling and complexity. Uh, I think she's referring to a single supplier or uh, actually him. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, what is the strategy for mitigation when this problem occurs? Basically, if you're stuck with a single supplier, what do you do? Yeah, not yeah. Much, so I think not it, much you could yeah, do. Right? I, mean, I think it's a fantastic question, especially for custom products. Let's say molds, let's say cavities, let's say forged products, and all of that. I, I think I get it. This could be a question from a medical device industry or an automobile industry or an aerospace industry, and I, I completely get where this is coming from. So I, I think I think we should address this question offline also, Shakti. But I think uh, some of the key mitigation steps which we've seen is supplier development programs keeping certain uh, uh, functions, for example, like a design function uh, in-house, looking at offshore functions, so on and so forth. But then I think we'll have to have a conversation with Ashley as to which industry she's referring to, which particular category is she referring to? Is it is it automobile tooling? Is it aerospace tooling? So I think it gets into a lot of specifics around thresholds and uh, variances, so on and so forth. But we could, we could I think we should connect post this and uh, see how we can help her out. Sure, sure. And the next question is from uh, Robert Wildrick. Uh, savings versus budgeted massive inflation estimates uh, would be called sandbagging by finance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a statement as well as a uh, yeah. probably a wing attack on finance, but absolutely. No, no, it's a good point. And this is something which I actually wanted to talk about. Uh, one, of, one, of, one of the key things uh, out of an inflation exercise is not just about me beating the market. And I think it fits into uh, Robert's question around, um, you know, uh, how do you beat a market where, for example, inflation is through the roof, right? So there are other metrics which could be considered. Uh, I don't know whether finance is going to approve this. Maybe they won't. It depends upon the organization. It depends upon whether you can pull these metrics. But Shakti, one of the things which we've been seeing is a lot of other metrics outside of just beating the market, right? Uh, COGS is a contribution of revenue. How, is, how much has that changed? CapEx per square feet. Packaging cost per hectoliter of beer, right? What's the packaging cost per unit weight of a drug formulation? What's the spend velocity of each one of the categories in procurement? What's the R&D speed to market? So essentially, instead of baselining it to the market, you're baselining it to the competition, and you're basically saying that I'm beating competition. So think of it as a flip of market share for sales. What's the comparison for that particular category? And Sometimes finance organizations take that into consideration. But the bigger point over here, Shakti, is that if you're baselining uh, price in an inflationary economy against previously purchased price, you're never going to hit your scorecard targets because you're going to go negative, right? Which basically means moving forward, budget carefully for every quarter's prices. That way, there is some wiggle room to be able to look at it and finance approving that it was actually a cost saving, right? So I think the key is in budgeting carefully, because if you're going to budget it wrong, then you're never going to hit the targets. Finance is never going to say that procurement's done a good job. They're going to be like, you've lost money. So that, that discussion will always keep spinning in circles between the CFO and the CPO. Okay. Um, next question is from Puneet Yadav. One simple question, cement and steel prices are moving abruptly for the past one year. 
yeah any idea what the future will be like according to your model uh, thanks in advance oh yeah absolutely absolutely i think we should get puneet's uh, email coordinates and shakti as you know we we send out what are called periodicals every month for about uh, 150 commodities uh, one was cement and what was other uh, the other category from puneet shakti uh, steel okay so steel. let's send it out and we've got different uh, grades of steel so let's send out CSSS, HRC, CRC. Let's send out those uh, periodicals which we generate uh, first thing in the morning to Puneet tomorrow. We can send it as a PowerPoint presentation so he can take a look at it. Sure, sure. Uh, so Robert Wildrick uh, says good points. Thank you for answering his question on sandbagging uh, my finance. Anyway, uh, so Shobit Sharma uh, makes a comment here. Another dialogue to have with finance is what they are factoring in our own business, then have collaborative effort on establishing the correct inflation risk to measure uh, savings against. I think it's a very good point uh, by Shobit Sharma. Uh, There's a kind of uh, critique, I would say, from Thomas Rockwell. Uh, uh, it's a very interesting comment, <laughs> uh, uh, Please summarize your presentation. That's what Thomas says. Uh, for example, we suggested, quote, we suggested we have the data you need to specifically analyze your business, quote, unquote. Basically, just giving an example, uh, a long story short, uh, that said, why uh, we know why these things are restricted, but I'm not sure what we learned here today or what you're offering. Please clarify. So basically, sure, Thomas absolutely. wants to know, I think uh, he couldn't con really connect with some of the points we raised. So very briefly, Vail, uh, elevator pitch. What is it that we are offering here? We are offering a six to 12 month inflation forecasts on any category which you'd like for us to do an assessment on. Also providing a alternate set of countries, suppliers and sourcing strategies which you can look at to beat inflation in the next quarter. So that's what we're offering. So we can actually provide all of these outputs to you. Uh, how about shortages, way? because we spoke about shortages also. Yeah, no, so I keep it as short as possible. Of course, it covers everything around capacity utilization, yeah. shortages, okay. demand. Anyway, sure, it's two sides of the same coin in most uh, categories, in fact. Yeah. Yep. Uh, thank you. Thank, thanks, Vail. Uh, next one is Juan Nunes. Uh, when you recommend in some categories, don't renegotiate. Why you, why are you specifically recommending that? Uh, sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I think the point over there was you might not be able to renegotiate was where I was actually coming from. So there might be a category where you're probably not the biggest buyer out there. You probably represent the smallest industry in terms of demand, mm -hmm. right? Or or uh, the supplier's margins are so way for them that you just can't renegotiate. They're not going to listen to you, right? So the market dictates terms. Suppliers dictate terms. So it, it really, uh, maybe if I said that, I, uh, yeah, maybe that was not the right language, but it's not about don't renegotiate. You will not be able to renegotiate because nothing's going to move in that renegotiation table. Uh, by the way, do you know Ashley Norton from TCS JLR? Uh, because we just got a ping from one of my team members. Uh, have you worked with them? It, okay. Yeah, I think it might be difficult to answer that question with other people around uh, Shakti. You know what I'm saying? Okay, no problem. Uh, Helen Veronique Lacomte. Uh, this is the next question, Will. World is volatile and forecasts are less and less relevant. Do you propose recommendation to become more agile in our supply chain and organization? Target is to avoid tactical and opportunist actions that are not relevant in long term and not aligned with long term partnerships. We tend to build with uh, strategic suppliers. So it's a very profound question, Will. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, Shakti. And I think it's a very internal question too, more than a market intelligence provider trying to answer that. But yeah, I think the answer is quite simple. Uh, execution is going to be impossible or very close to impossible, uh, not in a large organization like most of our attendees. Um, I think any organization which can track price focus, input costs, inflation, benchmarks, all kinds of risk, um, all kinds of multi-tier supply chain uh, disruptions, um, any kind of alerts which actually begins this entire cascading of activities. I'll pick a couple of examples, uh, Shakti, right? Uh, natural gas, one of the key proponents of whatever changed is a Siberian gas processing unit accident. 
do I know what happened today and what's going to be the impact six months from today? Do you have a model which predicts that, right? Uh, using data, of course, not 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 just a uh, random prediction. If anybody has that model internally, where they can, uh, as an organization, internally track all of these and not react to market changes, but can actually predict and say that if this is happening today, here's the worst case scenario which could happen six months away. Same with, uh, for example, what happened between China and Australia with regard to coal, right? It happened. Everybody knows what happened a year ago. But do I know that it's going to come and uh, hit my prices of, for example, a particular commodity which I'm buying from a supplier because of outages, because of coal-based generation of electricity? How do you do those linkages? I think that's critical. And if any organization can be agile enough to build those interdependencies, map those out, uh, and that's why I kept talking about cost models which connected to different partners, not just internally within the organization. If anybody can do that, then absolutely yes. This becomes an excellent model which is not driven by theory or volatility, but internally you can actually understand how you need to shift your sourcing strategies. Yeah, that's important, right? It brings in a certain level of objectivity so that uh, you don't fight this sandbagging battles uh, with finance, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, Puneet Yadav says thanks a lot. He's given his email ID. Thank you, Puneet. We will, as Vail mentioned, we will send you the uh, answer via email, a larger one on cement and steel, that is. Uh, we are actually, uh, you know, nearing the end of the hour. Can we take uh, one more question, Vail? Oh, of course, absolutely, Shakti. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So, what are Barrow's key data sources for different inputs into this uh, inflation model? Uh, is primary research also involved or it's only secondary? Thank you. Yeah, uh, there, there is primary research also involved. Uh, Shakti, so I'll, I'll just give an example. So, for example, let's say you're building a cost model. There is no way in which you can build a cost model by just using secondary research. You need to talk to suppliers, distributors, port authorities. So, absolutely, yes. Long story short, yes, there is primary research also involved, which also means you can tweak the model based on that particular user's needs. Okay. Um, uh, I think I think yeah it's it's almost time uh, maybe we can end it now uh, unless there are any further questions. Uh, okay, uh, Michelle. Okay, Michelle Blanchard just posted a comment. Well, this was a really good session. Thank you for hosting. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for your kind comments. Uh, we have one more minute. If anyone has any question, uh, please feel free to post it. We are happy to even extend it by five minutes just in case. Um, Maybe we will we'll wait for a minute. Uh, okay, Marcus uh, says, uh, thank you very much for those interesting insights. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, Robert Wildrick has uh, posted a comment. Uh, buyers will be too old to care by the time that they do the work manually. <laughs> Automation is required. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Fantastic, point. fantastic point, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, completely agree. And the, quite a few of us, uh, quite a few of, quite a few people had asked whether a recording will be available. Yes, uh, we will email you the uh, session recording shortly once we, uh, you know, compile it. I think I think that's about it. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Vail. That was a very insightful session on how to uh, make, how to how best to make use of Barrow's inflation model. Uh, we have run out of time. We will try to answer uh, by email if you have any question uh, that you have for us. Oh, just Jack, Jackie Wade just posted a question you know, right when you were about to close. How do you reevaluate new suppliers internationally and mitigate vessel delays? Sure. So there are specific tools which actually help you do that, uh, Shakti. There are specific tracking tools which allow to do that. It cannot be done in-house unless uh, it's just too expensive to do it. Uh, uh, we do have access to them, right, Shakti? So I can actually send out to Jackie maybe tomorrow uh, how our clients are basically checking on vessel delays. I myself have used a lot of these tools out there. You can send a yeah. list to her and if she wants to take a look at it. Yeah, vessel delays, obviously, there's a subscription. But how about re-evaluating re suppliers internationally? I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we'll have to context. get into specifics, but I think mm. she what she what she's probably looking to understand is domestic. You might have a lot of data. She's probably referring to North America or the U.S. as domestic. How do you evaluate a supplier? Just as an example, out of Latin America or uh, APAC, so on and so forth. 
Uh, we can talk to her about our supply monitoring service and how we do that using our data partners. Uh, Shakti, we, I think it's a it's a good conversation to continue having. We can send out uh, our our uh, evaluation deck so that she can take a look at how we do it. Okay, uh, that's great. Uh, Jackie Jackie says thank you, Bail. Anyway, uh, right. so this marks the end of our session. A big thank you to all the participants for logging in today. And yes, we will be sharing the webinar recording link with uh, all of you soon. Uh, please do reach out to the email address on the screen. If you have any additional questions, we would love to answer them for you. Uh, thank you and have a good day. And for all those in Asia, good night. Cool. Thank you, Shakti. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Bye. Bye.